welcome to the DC Today Thursday edition, last DC Today of the week, and a big, big rally day. The Dow up 383 points, well over 1%. The S&P up about 1.3%. The NASDAQ up almost 2%. Uh, so while Dividend Cafe tomorrow will not get into everything happening this week in the market, we'll close out at least the Thursday with a DC Today focused on a few things happening in the economy and the market. And, you know, it's our favorite topic, this um, issue with the Fed and their insistence on tightening credit, tightening financial conditions, while inflation is dropping like a rock. And yesterday, as my partner Trevor Cummings discussed, and he shared some things that I had written and some other commentary he provided, that was very useful at evaluating what the CPI data said yesterday. But today we had the PPI, and I just want to do a quick refresher. CPI is the Consumer Price Index. It's reflecting what people pay as sort of a final price, the consumer price. And it could be food and energy. It could be a whole lot of other services and products and goods. But the producer prices refers to kind of inputs or wholesale prices, if you will. Both things obviously refer to the price level in the economy. And candidly, it's kind of difficult for consumer prices to be going higher when producer prices aren't, because you would think in a perfect world that um, what is happening up or down and the rate at which it's happening with wholesale prices is feeding into final prices paid. So you had rather significant disinflation evidence today in the PPI number um, down 0.5% on the month, but this is the data point I want to focus on, on headline PPI, which includes food and energy, 2.7% year over year producer price inflation. That number in March of last year, one year ago, was 11.7%. So that is the textbook definition of disinflation going from nearly 12% to below 3% in year over year price inflation of wholesale prices uh, at, the, at the headline level. Now, that does include food and energy. And a lot of that disinflation is because energy prices were lower, particularly on the wholesale side of gasoline. But even when you look at just core PPI, we are now 3.4% year over year, which again is not only about half, uh, less than half of what it had been, but just a month over month, that number was 4.8 year over year last month. So you had a significant decline at the core level, which takes out food and energy, and at the wholesale headline level year over year. So if I haven't bored you enough yet with the, the overall statistics, this is the part I kind of want to get to. Did the market go up today because it now knows that the Fed is not going to raise rates next month? The futures market still is showing a 66% chance of another quarter point rate hike. So did the market go up just because it doesn't think the Fed should raise rates? I don't think that's how markets act. Last I checked, markets price what they believe will happen. So there does continue to be a bit of tension between the rate market, the bond market, and, and equities. But where we are in terms of a rally, just let's call it the last month, since that kind of mid-March level, is significantly higher in equities. A lot of that came the last week of March. You had another big rally here today. And there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say schizophrenia, but I would say certainly um, lack of clarity uh, uh, in markets as to what is leading and why. You know, you have had low beta leading a lot of this rally, more defensive sectors, non-cyclicals. And then you've had um, today, the communication services was the leading sector. You had um, real estate actually was down 0.4%. Uh, it was the only negative performing sector today. And, and you, the NASDAQ up 2%. So you had you know, a, a kind of lower quality rally, rally today. The bond market also didn't move a lot. So it wasn't like, uh, I mean, the bond market's up quite a bit. But today, as equities were flying, you know, the 10-year yield was up two basis points. Not a lot, but you are sitting at 3.44%. My point is that I don't think anyone can look at stocks or bonds today or over a month or over the year and say, oh, there's this clear, obvious message to markets. What there is is a clear, obvious message from David Bonson to you that the Fed should not be raising rates again. 
And yet, I don't think that the market is reflecting a clarity that they won't. I do believe credit, you're going to see a chart in Dividend Cafe tomorrow. I do believe credit into small business is more or less choked off into commercial real estate from the banking sector, pretty much choked off. And unless the Fed is purposely at this point saying we want to break that part of the economy, I don't get it. If the Fed's real objective is to be able to take credit for having beat the supply side inflation that was evidenced uh, in place before anything happened with rates whatsoever, then I think they're all ready to do a victory lap now. So why they would proceed is totally beyond me. But I have to tell you, when I do commentary on markets, what I think will happen, what does happen, why it happened, what we think will happen next, not what I think should happen. Now, I only throw in what I think should happen so far because I am fond of the sound of one hand clapping. The other thing I did in DC Today today is ask, answer a question. Um, and the last thing I want to do is use this podcast to point you to another podcast, but there is a link in DC Today. I'm getting so many more questions about the U.S. dollar. And, you know, last week's Dividend Cafe was committed to this issue with oil, OPEC plus, and the relevance of a China-Saudi alliance and what it means to the U.S. dollar. And people are wondering, are we going to lose our reserve currency status? And I just can't emphasize enough all of the arguments as to why that can't and won't happen anytime close to soon. A marginalizing of the dollar's power, a marginalizing of the dollar's ability as a transactional currency is totally different than what the world holds in reserves. And this idea that the world wants to hold Chinese currency in reserve when you can't get capital in and out of their country is ridiculous. And if China were to open their capital markets, they would have a trillion dollars lose that, leave that country overnight. And so how does that hold the currency strength? It, I need you to unpack this better at the uh, answer I give in DC Today. There's a link there. Fundamentally, there, I am very concerned about the way we behave, but unfortunately, it continues to be a relative versus absolute story. We're doing dumb things to hurt our dollar, but you cannot say that those things we're doing are not being done and then some in Europe or and then some in Japan. And what is the other currency that's going to take the dollar's place as a reserve currency? People, if you say China, you have to understand it's impossible when there's not a capital flow allowed out of the country. It will not happen. So therefore, um, we can all at once say that there are concerns with the dollar's transactional status and strength and purchasing power and signifier to the world of what we want to be as an economic leader. All of those things are true, and yet not say, oh, the dollar is about to lose its reserved currency. When someone says it to you, or you read it in a newsletter, or you read it as clickbait on the internet, or someone on social media wants to raise money to tell you something, or whatever it is, just ask the next question. If not dollar, who? Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for listening to, thanks for watching, and thank you for reading. The DC today. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the Dividend Cafe tomorrow. Mm -hmm.